Welcome back, everybody, to CPTSD, From Surviving to Thriving, written by Pete Walker, read by Sen Naomi Kierschultz. Toxic Shame and Soul Murder The rejecting responses of our parents to our emotional expression alienate us from our own feelings. Emotional abuse or neglect scares us out of our own emotions while simultaneously making us terrified of other people's feelings. John Bradshaw describes the devastation of the child's emotional nature as, quote, soul murder, unquote. He explains this as involving a process where the child's emotional expression his first language of self-expression is so assaulted with disgust that any emotional experience immediately devolves into toxic shame. I believe that toxic shame is the affect of the inner critic, and that inner critic thought processes are the cognitions of shame. A terrible yin and yang process emanating from our original abandonment. Because of the deadly one-two punch of familial and societal attacks on our emotional selves, we need to recover our innate emotional intelligence. This is also deeply important because, as Carl Jung emphasized, our emotions tell us what is really important to us. When our emotional intelligence is restricted, we often do not know what we really want, and can consequently struggle mightily with even the smallest decisions. As emotional recovery progresses, the mindfulness described above begins to extend toward our emotional experience. This helps us to stop automatically dissociating from our feelings. We then learn to identify our feelings and choose healthy ways to respond to them and from them. Such emotional development illuminates our own natural preferences and in turn aids us in making easier and better choices. Towards the end of a long-term therapy, a male client told me, quote, Yesterday I was contemplating what I have discovered in the years of our work together, and I'm amazed at how much my values have shifted away from those of the macho family and culture I grew up in. I feel now like I prefer the arts to science, novels to nonfiction, gardening to watching golf, and hanging out with my partner at home to partying at the bar, unquote. Grieving as Emotional Intelligence Grieving is the key process for reconnecting with our repressed emotional intelligence. Grieving reconnects us with our full complement of feelings. Grieving is necessary to help us release and work through our pain about the terrible losses of our childhoods. These losses are like deaths of parts of ourselves, and grieving can often initiate their rebirth. Grieving and Verbal Ventilation Grieving restores our crucial developmentally arrested capacity to verbally ventilate. Verbal ventilation is the penultimate grieving practice. It is speaking from your feelings in a way that releases and resolves your emotional distress. I believe the following description of a six-panel cartoon visually conveys the powerful, transformative power of verbal ventilation. In the first panel of the wordless cartoon, a woman with a dark cloud over her head is talking to a friend who has a shining sun over hers. In panel two, as the first woman gestures in a way that indicates complaining, the cloud covers her friend's sun. In panel three, the cloud emits a bolt of lightning as she angrily purges and her friend glowers along with her. In panel four, the cloud rains on them as they embrace, commiserating in the rain of their shared tears. In panel five, relief spreads over their faces as the cloud moves away from the sun. And in panel six, the sun shines over both of them as they smile and slip into pleasant conversation. This cartoon reflects the fully realized power of verbal ventilation, which is the key bonding process in intimacy. It is also the key healing process of effective therapy, and here is an example of what verbally ventilating looks like in a therapy session. A client arrives flashbacked and in pain. 
He verbally ventilates about it. He is the regressed, hurt child, feeling bad, and part of him is sad, and part of him is mad. He is once again lost in the painful feelings of his original abandonment, and this state is like a death that responds well to grieving. As he lets his feelings come into his voice, he talks, cries, and angers out his pain. Through this processing of his pain, he then gradually moves out of his flashback. He is restored to his normal, everyday sense that he is no longer trapped in his traumatic childhood. Relief about this returns him to his normal ability to cope. If his grieving is deep enough, he customarily feels more hopeful and lighthearted. Not infrequently, his sense of humor resurfaces and laughter punctuates his continuing verbal ventilation. This laughter is usually much different than the sarcastic, self-bullying humor of his critic that he might have begun the session with. The inner critic is sometimes so hostile to grieving that shrinking the critic may need to be your first recovery priority. Until the critic is sufficiently tamed, grieving can actually make flashbacks worse rather than perform the restorative processes it alone can initiate. I have worked with numerous clients who were so traumatized around grieving that we needed to spend many months working on the cognitive level before grieving was released from the spoiling effects of the toxic critic. Chapter 11 provides a great deal of practical guidance for restoring your ability to grieve. Spiritual Healing Soothing abandonment losses via a higher sense of belonging. Spiritual beliefs are, of course, a subject of personal and sometimes private concern, and I believe and hope what I write here is not proselytizing. My aim instead is to point out psychological concepts that have a non-sectarian spiritual aspect. I am aware, however, that some survivors have suffered terrible spiritual abuse in childhood, and if the term quote-unquote spiritual is offensive or triggering in any way, please feel free to bypass this section. There are many other useful tools in this toolbox. A key aspect of the abandonment depression in CPTSD is the lack of a sense of belonging to humanity, life, anyone or anything. I have met many survivors whose first glimmer of quote-unquote belonging came to them on a quest that began as a spiritual pursuit. Finding nothing but betrayal in the realm of humans, they turned to the spiritual for help. Spiritual pursuits are sometimes fueled by an unconscious hope of finding a sense of belonging. The worst thing that can happen to a child is to be unwelcomed in his family of origin, to never feel included. Moreover, many survivors have little or no experience of any social arena that feels safe and welcoming. Many survivors also do not find a sense of belonging in traditional or organized religions, finding conventional religion too reminiscent of their dysfunctional families. Some survivors look to more solitary spiritual approaches. They find a sense of belonging to something larger and more comforting by reading spiritual books or engaging in meditative practices. This allows them to bypass the danger of direct human contact. Other survivors have spiritual experiences of belonging to something greater and worthwhile by being in nature, by listening to music, or by appreciating the arts. I once marveled at a book whose title now eludes me that was a compendium of quotes from many renowned people who had numinous experiences through the direct perception of nature's beauty. A numinous experience is a powerful moving feeling of well-being accompanied by a sense that there is a positive, benign force behind the universe as well as within yourself. This, in turn, sometimes brings enough grace with it that you have a profound feeling that you are essentially worthwhile, that you belong in this life, and that life is a gift. One of my website respondents sent me her personal account of therapeutic gratitude. Her name is Mary Quinn of Ireland. In answer to my request to reprint her writing, she replied, quote, 
Yes, and in honor of my little one and for all the times her voice went unheard, you may use my name, unquote. Quote, I went to the beach a couple of days ago in the morning and sat watching the sun coming up. I had an incredible moment of the purest clarity. I was watching birds flying low over the water, the moon was still visible, and the sun was rising. I realized I was looking at three planets and there was not another person in sight. It was a moment of breathtaking beauty and the tears slid down my face at how deep it is possible to feel. I have been numb for so long. I wrapped my arms around myself and felt the presence of the little one so strongly it was almost painful, but in a healing way, if that makes sense. I realized that all the life experiences I have had to date brought me to that exact moment and gave me the depth to appreciate it at that level. A sense of peace washed through me like a gentle wave and for a few moments I felt a connection to a feeling of everything being part of life. It was breathtakingly beautiful. I felt like I was experiencing this moment with all of my senses, and I never knew it was possible to be so much in my body. Quote, The gratitude feeling is deep and profound when it occurs. It feels like a moment of connection to life itself on the deepest level, and all life circumstances and what I deem as problems pale to insignificance in those moments, and there is only love in its purest form. It truly feels like a blessing, albeit fleeting, but gives enough sustenance and hope to continue the journey." Unquote. Whatever the source, spiritual or numinous occurrences sometimes provide the survivor with her first sense of belonging to something bigger and essentially good. Such experiences can lead a survivor to an author or speaker or fellow traveler with similar sensibilities, and sometimes a door opens for finding comfort with a fellow human. Eventually, this may even grow into a sense that there are some humans out there who are good and safe enough to engage with. Gratitude and Good Enough Parenting When developing children receive, quote, good enough parenting, unquote, they feel that life is a gift, even though it typically comes with difficult and painful experiences. The term good enough parenting derives from the work of renowned adult and child psychologist D.W. Winnicott, who coined the term, quote, good enough mothering, unquote, to describe his observation that children do not need parents to be perfect. He noticed through his long career that children grew up with their self-esteem and capacity for intimacy intact when their parents were reasonably consistent with their love and support. Nowadays, many therapists attach the phrase, quote, good enough, unquote, to concepts like friend, partner, therapist, or person. This is usually done to deconstruct perfectionistic expectations of relationships, expectations that are so unrealistic that they are destructive to essentially worthwhile relationships. When I apply the concept of good enough to people, I generally mean that a person is essentially good-hearted, tries to be fair, and meets his or her commitments a large portion of the time. I also like to apply, quote, good enough, unquote, to other concepts such as a good enough job, a good enough try, a good enough outing, a good enough day, or a good enough life. I apply this concept liberally to contradict the black and white, all or none thinking of the critic, which reflexively judges people and things as defective unless they are perfect. Good enough parents provide generous amounts of support, protection, and comforting. They also guide their children to deal constructively with recurring existential difficulties, such as loss, real villains, painful world events, and normal disappointments with friends and family. Most importantly, they model how disappointments with intimates can be repaired. A key way they do this is to easily forgive their children for normal mistakes and shortcomings. 
Children who receive good enough parenting easily recognize and protect themselves from bullying and exploitative people because they do not have to become accustomed to being treated unfairly. Growing up in a safe and loving enough family naturally enhances the child's capacity to notice and enjoy the many gifts that life also brings. He learns that there is enough good in life to significantly outweigh its necessary losses and travails. In the traumatizing family, however, there is little or nothing that is good enough, and hence little for which to be grateful. The child instead is forced to overdevelop a critic that hyper-focuses on what is dangerously imperfect in her as well as others. This sometimes helps her to hide aspects of herself that might be punished. It may further assist her to avoid people who might be punishing. Unfortunately, years of this habituates the child into only seeing herself, life, and others in a negative light. Consequently, when she grows up and becomes free of her truly harmful family, she cannot see that life offers her many new possibilities. Her ability to see the good in herself and certain safe enough others remains developmentally arrested. The cultivation of gratitude requires a balanced perspective. You can learn to see and appreciate the good in life without giving up your ability to discern what is truly negative and unacceptable in the present. Somatic Healing Trauma takes its toll on the body in many ways. We need to comprehend the physical damage that CPTSD wreaks on our bodies to motivate us to adopt practices that help us to heal on this level. Most of the physiological damage of extended trauma occurs because we are forced to spend so much time in hyper-arousal, stuck in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. When we are chronically stressed out, stuck in sympathetic nervous system activation, detrimental somatic changes become ingrained in our bodies. Here are some of the most common examples of body-harming reactions to CPTSD stress. Hypervigilance, shallow and incomplete breathing, constant adrenalization, armoring, i.e. chronic muscle tightness, wear and tear from rushing and armoring, inability to be fully present, relaxed, and grounded in our bodies, sleep problems from being overactivated, digestive disorders from a tightened digestive tract, and physiological damage from excessive self-medication with alcohol, food, or drugs. Moreover, in cases of physical and sexual abuse, our capacities to be physically comforted by touch are eliminated or compromised, and in cases of verbal and emotional abuse, our capacities to be comforted by eye and voice contact are undeveloped or seriously diminished. Somatic self-help. The good news is that some somatic repair happens automatically when we reduce our physiological stress by more efficient flashback management. Particularly potent help also comes from the grieving work of reclaiming the ability to cry self-compassionately and to express anger self-protectively. Both processes can release armoring promote embodiment, improve sleep, decrease hyperarousal, and encourage deeper and more rhythmic breathing. Without further expressly somatic work, however, a full relaxed inhabitancy of your body may not be achieved. Fortunately, there are other modes of self-help for healing the physiological wounds of CPTSD. The quote, somatic mindfulness, unquote, and quote, introspective somatic work, unquote, sections of chapter 12 describe techniques that can help you to decrease adrenalization, to relax more deeply, and to improve your digestion. Moreover, step 7 of the flashback management steps at the beginning of chapter 8 contains six somatic self-help techniques for relaxing out of the physiological hyperarousal of a flashback. Another especially helpful somatic practice is stretching. Regular systematic stretching of the body's major muscle groups can help you to reduce the armoring that occurs when your 4F response is chronically triggered. 
This results from the fact that 4F activation tightens and contracts your body in anticipation of the need to fight back, flee, get small to escape notice, or rev up to launch into people-pleasing activity. Learning to stretch was a major ordeal for me because of my extreme body armoring. As noted above, it was a task of self-nurturing that I resented intensely, and it took me a long time to adopt stretching as a regular practice. The fact that I had to weather many toxic shame attacks because I was always the least flexible person in the group did not help matters. Moreover, when various people commented about how good it felt to stretch, how good it felt to stretch, I felt both puzzled and further shamed because it was anything but pleasant for me. Thankfully, however, reading the literature about it convinced me about its great importance, and persistent practice eventually gave me results that I could not discount. I was rewarded by the resolution of decades-old back problems, and although I still rarely enjoy the practice, I am absolutely convinced that it explains why I am still able to run, swim, and play basketball in my mid-sixties. Stretching has become, for me, a true labor of love and self-nurturance. Yoga, massage, meditation, and relaxation training are formalized disciplines to aid in letting go of unnecessary body tension. Reasonably priced classes in these modalities are usually available in most communities. Finally, freeze types and freeze subtypes also typically benefit from various types of movement therapy and aerobic exercise regimes. Moreover, Assertiveness training and anger release work are especially helpful for survivors who have difficulty accessing their assertiveness or instincts of self-protection. See PTSD and somatic therapy. There are also various somatic therapies that can help our bodies heal. As with my earlier comments about CBT, I encourage you to be wary of somatic approaches that claim to heal CPTSD without working on the cognitive and emotional levels described above. Some approaches also believe that their techniques eliminate the fundamental necessity of grieving the losses of childhood, and understanding how abusive and negligent parenting is at the root of our problems. Nonetheless, some somatic therapists can ease the physiological traumas that are locked in our bodies as long as the practitioner is not actively dismissing or impeding the client's cognitive and emotional work. In this vein, it is my opinion that techniques like EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, and somatic experiencing are very powerful tools for stress reduction. They are especially helpful in resolving simple PTSD. However, they are not complete CPTSD therapies, unless the practitioner is eclectic enough to be incorporating inner critic and grieving the losses of childhood work. Other helpful somatic techniques include Rosen work, Rolfing, Rebirthing, and Reichian work. These techniques can also be very helpful in aiding the recovery of the ability to therapeutically emote both tears and anger. For survivors of physical and or sexual abuse, I believe Rosen work is especially helpful. I found that Rosen work's emphasis on soft touch helped heal my CPTSD startle response to physical touch. A startle response is the sudden full-body flinching that survivors experience at loud noises or unanticipated physical contact. This is usually a somatic flashback to previous abuses. In my case, the startle response was installed in me by my parents through frequent face slapping. As a lap swimmer in public pools, it has taken me ages to significantly reduce being triggered by the hand and arm movements of people who swim alongside me. I also had to shop around to find a Rosen worker who welcomed my use of the verbal ventilation process. Some practitioners prefer to work in silence, and... This limits or eliminates the therapeutic benefit to most survivors. It is also important to emphasize here that somatic therapies can be especially helpful in healing the anxiety reaction to touch 
and physical closeness that many survivors of physical or sexual abuse experience. Exceptions to this are the survivors that I have met who have experienced remediation of this symptom through the help of an especially kind and safe partner. The Role of Medication As a psychotherapist, I am not authorized to give pharmaceutical advice, but I have frequently noticed that survivors who need pharmaceutical help seem to benefit most from SSRI antidepressants. Taken at the right dosage, SSRIs do not usually blunt your affect in a way that makes grieving impossible. Moreover, if your critic does not budge with extended critic-shrinking work, SSRIs can usually reduce its volume and vitriol enough so that you can effectively shrink it. Once it is diminished enough, you can dispense with medication. One caveat here is that Unless you do extensive critic shrinking work, the critic will be as strong as ever when the medications wear off. Self-medication For those who have been repeatedly unsuccessful at stopping or reducing the use of non-therapeutic medications and substances, Gabor Mate's work on harm reduction may be helpful. Drug and alcohol recovery is beyond the scope of this book, but if you are stuck in habits of self-medication that are not allowing you to progress in your CPTSD recovery, I encourage you to get help from a substance abuse recovery program or from 12-step programs like Alcoholics or Narcotics Anonymous. Working with food issues Let us explore one last arena of physical healing, and that is dietary self-help. I agree with John Bradshaw who says that almost everyone who grows up in a dysfunctional family has an eating disorder. This is a key factor in the digestive tract problems that are a common symptom of CPTSD. Changing your eating habits is extremely difficult. A client left this quote on my waiting room bulletin board. Quote, alcohol and other drug recovery is like dealing with a tiger in a cage. Recovery from eating disorders is like taking that tiger out of the cage three times a day and then taking it for a walk." Unquote. Deconstructing food addictions, then, is daunting work that needs to be approached gradually and with a sense of compassion. This is because children who are traumatically abandoned naturally turn to food for comfort. Food offers us our first outside source of self-soothing, and when a child is starving for love, he frequently makes food his love object. Over the years, he commonly quote-unquote elevates it to the status of a drug. Moreover, increasing scientific evidence is showing that processed food products combining high levels of sugar, salt, and fat are especially addictive. Food addictions begin pre-verbally, they are functional and useful at the time and help us to survive the unbearable feelings of the abandonment melange. Unfortunately, we are typically forced to rely on food soothing for so long that this overdependence is extremely difficult to overcome, and I do not recommend that anyone in early recovery make this their primary focus unless they have a life-threatening food issue. Instead, I prefer to recommend Mate's harm reduction approach. Additionally, Janine Roth's book, Breaking Free from Compulsive Eating, also offers a moderate and sensible approach to dietary improvement. While many survivors can be unconscious of their damaging eating habits, I have met various survivors who take it to the opposite extreme. I was once in the ranks of those who obsessively overfocus on dietary self-help, hoping and expecting that all their suffering will be resolved if they can just find the perfect diet. Many also chase after every new highly touted supplement in this pursuit. Some of us also approach exercise in this manner. These are understandable but simplistic versions of the salvation fantasy and are typically pursued at the exclusion of working on more core issues of recovering. Nonetheless, almost everyone has some ideas about how they can eat and exercise more healthily. My recommendation is to try dietary adjustments when you can on a moderate, doable level. This has been Chapter 2, Part 2 of Complex PTSD, From Surviving to Thriving, written by Pete Walker, 
read by Sen Naomi Kier Schultz. Stay tuned for chapter three.